Hi, welcome to our awesome classical mechanics course, Physics 411. And I'm so excited that you are here. Today, we're going to start with a review of what we did last time. Then, we're going to discuss Hamilton's principle of least action. And uh, we're going to play around uh, with the consequences. Plus, uh, we're going to uh, discuss Noether's theorem and uh, energy conservation. So there is a lot of exciting things to look forward to. And uh, let us start with a brief recap of what we did last time. Well, last time uh, we solved a bunch of problems, like uh, we dropped a rod on a frictionless table, or we dropped a particle so that it would free fall, or we looked at a pendulum, or a double pendulum, so there was a lot of good stuff. But perhaps the most uh, important thing for our future uh, uh, studies here in this course that uh, I would like to draw your attention to is uh, uh, the way to calculate kinetic energy of a system of particles. Remember, a while ago uh, we showed that if we wanted to compute an angular momentum of a system of particles, then that angular momentum of a system of particles would be the sum of the angular momentum associated with the motion of the center of mass plus the angular momentum associated with the motion around the center of mass, relative to the center of mass. That's what R stands for, relative to the center of mass. In a very similar way, we have shown that if we want to find kinetic energy of a system of particles, it can be decomposed in a very, very similar way. The total kinetic energy of a system of particles is the sum of the kinetic energy associated with the motion of the center of mass plus the kinetic energy associated with the motion relative to the center of mass. So total kinetic energy is the sum of TCM, kinetic energy associated with uh, the uh, motion of the center of mass, plus TRCM, uh, relative to the center of mass. Uh, and uh, TCM, as we've shown, was simply the total mass of the system uh, times uh, the velocity of the center of mass divided by 2, and RCM was the sum of over all the particles or uh, pieces that make up uh, our system mi vi prime squared divided by 2 where uh, v prime i was the difference between vi and uh, vcm so the this value vi prime is the velocity relative to the center of mass. Great, so this is perhaps the most important thing that you would want to take away a uh, conceptual thing uh, from the previous lecture. We will be using this, uh, actually both of these relationships uh, throughout the rest of the course and uh, actually uh, during the midterms and final exams, most likely. Good. Uh, so I think this is the most important recap. I'm not going to go into the details of the problems. Um, so what I'm going to go now is go ahead and go to part two of our awesome lecture five, where we will actually go ahead and try and uh, derive equations of oil Lagrange uh, from first principles without assuming f equals two ma, but from the principle of least action and I'm going to see you there. Hi everyone, welcome back to our awesome course, Classical Mechanics, Physics 411. Uh, this is part two of lecture five. And we're going to be talking uh, today about the Hamilton's principle of least action. Well, um, this is a principle that is not totally foreign to us. Um, you know, uh, when there is a task at hand that we would like to complete, then uh, we try to minimize the amount of work that we need to do in order to get there, right? Who would do more work than necessary? Um, well, I'm talking to you. 
uh, you went to grad school. And maybe I'm talking about myself too. Um, uh, definitely the least action is not creating a light board and recording these lectures in 8K. Uh, so sometimes um, this principle actually, as we will see, um, can be called the principle of most action. Um, I'm not joking here. Um, nature also thinks alike, I guess. So, uh, what is this? What is this principle? Well, this is a very powerful way of deriving Euler-Lagrange equations in a general way, where it's not tied to a particular uh, set of laws of physics. So let's get to it. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a way to characterize the amount of action? You know, if it's the least action, then we would like to quantify it, what action is. So suppose that we actually have defined action. Um, and uh, let's define it. Let's define action as an integral over a path that uh, I will discuss in a second. So starting with t1 and uh, ending with t2, so we're integrating in time, of um, um, L, uh, which it going, is going to depend on a bunch of qi's, uh, uh, generalized coordinates, a bunch of qi dots, which are the derivatives of those coordinates in time, uh, or velocities, and time. And we are going to be integrating it in time. So this uh, will be action. So what is this path that we're going to integrate? Well, you know, uh, you can get from point one to point two in multiple ways. But equations of motion uh, tell us that there is just one right way of getting there. So probably the right way will, you know, uh, minimize this action. So let's uh, draw um, a diagram. So let's say that we have our n uh, variables, uh, generalized variables, q1, q2, qn. Of course, I cannot draw n-dimensional space. The best I can do is three-dimensional. So that's what I did, um, but uh, we can think of it as a multidimensional space. And uh, suppose that uh, we are interested in finding the path that nature will take to go from point one at time t1 to point two at time t2. So suppose that this is the path. But um, how would we know that this is the right path that nature would take? Well, what if this path minimized action? Hence, uh, the least action principle. How can we mathematically quantify that the action is minimized? Well, um, we could try and move the path around and see what happens to the value of i of our action. If uh, when we move the path around, uh, the action um, is at a maximum or at a minimum, then if we move the path around, action won't really change, right? So that will be kind of our goal, uh, to take the derivative of i with respect to shift of the path, whatever that is, but we'll define that in a second, and uh, set it to zero. So uh, let's uh, look at the alter alternate paths. So maybe there are a bunch of them uh, that the system could take. Uh, so the original one would go from 1 to 2, and all those other alternate paths will go from the same point 1 to the same point 2, but they will be slightly shifted by a really small, infinitesimally small amount. So what will be the response of i to this shift? It's uh, uh, called a variation, and uh, we, denoted it through, we denote it through delta. So if we vary the path, then for instance, delta qi will be variation, but because qi is actually a function of time, it's no longer just a change in one number, it's a change in an entire function. So how can we mathematically describe this kind of continuous transformation of a function? This is precisely what it is. So let us uh, say that this delta qi will give us the difference between the original function and the variation of this function. Um, 
So maybe we can even call it better instead of variation. Maybe we can say it's a perturbed function so that uh, we uh, started at one, ended in two, but we perturbed the path. So let's call it perturbed. And uh, we're going to subtract perturbed minus original. So a uh, perturbed function, uh, let's denote it as qi with the upper index epsilon. So that will be a function of time as well, just as the original function was, which we will denote through zero. So epsilon is kind of this parameter. Uh, at zero, uh, we're going to get back the original uh, function. But uh, at epsilon non-zero, uh, the function will be deviating more and more from the original, the larger and larger epsilon we choose. And uh, the way we're going to be able to parameterize that, we're going to be able to set that to epsilon times fi of t, uh, where uh, there is really just two conditions on fi. Uh, so fi is kind of the shape of this deformation or perturbation that we apply to our uh, path. So what we want fi uh, to satisfy is, remember, we keep the start and the end of our uh, trajectory fixed. So we would demand that fi of t1 is equal to fi of t2 and is equal to 0. So that is our requirement on fi and therefore a requirement on uh, the variation of our trajectory. Okay, so this is good. Now we've gotten the variation of qi's. But remember, we really want to make sure that variation of the action of this integral um, is going to vanish so that it's a, it's a minimum amount of action that we do. So here we will probably just have to go with the flow and see how it will work out. Um, so let us set uh, delta uh, acting on uh, i, on our action, um, using our intuition from uh, derivatives, so differentials. We can take the delta inside, so it will be delta acting on L of qi, qi dots, and uh, of time, and integrate it over time. Um, what can we do with L? Because we would like to uh, represent the variation of L in terms of variation of q, right? Um, so what's the response of L to variation of q? Well, L depends on q uh, through itself and its derivatives, right? And we're perturbing not just qi, we're perturbing, you know, uh, qi, qi plus 1, qi minus 1, all qi's. This is just a perturbation for one of them. Remember, we can perturb any of them and several of them at the same time in an independent way. So let's uh, see uh, what we can do. Maybe we can use a chain rule so that we can compute the response of L to the variation in qi. So let's try that integral from t1 to t2. Uh, and here we're going to have uh, dl dqi times delta qi, okay, plus uh, dl dq dot i times delta q dot i all integrated over time. And here we are implicitly uh, using Einstein rule uh, for summation where we are summing over repeated indices. So this is going to be summed over repeated indices. Uh, over here and over here. Just going to drop the, um, the sum symbol for compactness. So what can we do here? I think you can already see that there is a direct relationship between delta L and delta QI. If not for this delta QI dot, if not for the variation of velocities, 
So we have to do something about these velocities. Is there a way for us to get rid of them somehow? Well, uh, one potential idea is to integrate by parts. So if this is um, um, u and this is v dot, uh, then we can write that u times v dot, uh, where dot is the derivative in time, is going to be d dt of uv minus uh, u dot v. So that's what we can write, right? So let's try and use that and uh, then we can write out this expression and I'm going to go this way. So dl dqi is equal to uh, times that is equal to, so it's going to be d dt of uh, u times v, so uh, u is this, v is that, so u times v will be dl dq i dot times delta q i without the dot, right, because it's just v, plus uh, we're going to, actually, not plus, it's going to be a minus, right? Because we need to, well, here it's actually plus, right? Uh, we're going to subtract u dot times v. So u dot, it's going to be uh, d dt of uh, dl dqi, dl dqi dot, and we're going to multiply it by v, which will be delta q i. Oh, that's nice. So see, we have actually uh, gotten uh, what we wanted. Let me actually change the order of these so that it matches what we wrote out there. So it will be d dt of dl dq i dot times delta qi. So we have delta qi as a prefactor as we wanted instead of delta qi dot. Um, and if it wasn't for this term, then we would have gotten the relationship between delta L and uh, delta qi. So what about this term? Well, it's a full time derivative and this is an integral in time. So when we integrate this time derivative in time, it will be really the difference uh, of uh, this quantity uh, inside the derivative evaluated at t2 minus that value evaluated at t1, right? That's how integrals work. So does it help us? Huh. But see, it's multiplied by the variation of our generalized coordinate, which vanishes at the ends of the interval. So if this is really the difference um, that we're getting uh, of this underlined uh, uh, of, uh, value that is multiplied by delta qi, which vanishes at the beginning, at the end of our time interval, it means that we're going to get a zero. So this term will integrate out to zero because uh, it is zero at both ends because of this. So that's really cool. Um, that's good. So we now are ending up with just two terms. So let us uh, write down what that is. So we're going to take it down to here. So delta i is going to be an integral from t1 to t2 of uh, dl dqi. Um, oh, and I forgot a minus sign here, right? Because it was a minus u dot times v, so that has to be a minus over here. Uh, I knew there was a minus, so I caught myself in time. Minus d dt of dl dq dot i. And uh, all of that it's going to be multiplied by the delta qi that we're going to take out as a factor 
uh, and uh, it's going to be multiplied by dt. So that is our variance. And uh, one of the requirements that we have uh, is that variance vanishes because we would like to have the least action. So uh, therefore, it's, if it's a minimum, then the it's least action. Right? So we've gotten that to be 0. It means that this whole integral is 0. OK. Um, and I think you're starting to sense that something interesting is brewing over here because what we have gotten here are Lagrange's equations, or all the Lagrange equations that they're also known. So how can we get rid of the integral, get rid of these prefactors, and just say that uh, this uh, expression in brackets, in square brackets, is actually 0, because that's what we want. We want to get the Euler-Lagrange equations. And actually, there's a way, because right, we can pick any uh, displacement of qi that we want. Uh, we can displace a particular coordinate, not the others. Uh, we can, uh, so the variation in q is arbitrary, uh, with the only constraints at the end of the interval, which don't really matter, because what matters is how, uh, what happens to this equation throughout the solution. So, because we know the solution at the beginning and the end already. So that means that all we need uh, is complete freedom to choose delta q, which we have, which means that for any delta q this integral is zero, therefore the only way it can be true is if the expression in brackets is zero. So, uh, since true for any delta q i of time. Therefore, we are going to get that the expression in brackets uh, minus ddt of dl dq i dot is going to be zero. So we have gotten our Euler-Lagrange equations. So this is really, really exciting. So what do we conclude from here? We conclude from here that um, that Euler-Lagrange equations are more general than we thought. They don't only work for f equals to may, um, that classical mechanics. It can work for other systems that, for which you can come up with a reasonable um, expression for action. Uh, and that allows us to apply uh, all of the classical mechanics machinery to uh, such exciting fields as general relativity or special relativity or electromagnetism or quantum mechanics. So it's really exciting. Just one um, thing, just to be clear, because I didn't write it down, I spoke uh, so that it registers um, for any qi of t, with the constraint, of course, that uh, q delta qi of t vanishes at the ends. Uh, so I can say that has uh, delta qi of t1 equal to delta q i of t2, and uh, that all uh, equals to 0. I've gotten a little bit tight over here on space. Let's squeeze it in here that these two both are equal to 0. I'm super excited that this all fit on one board. You can see that I'm going and compressing, compressing, compressing. I'm definitely going to work uh, on uh, minimizing actions so that 
there is no minimum here and maximum over there. But uh, jokes aside, uh, you can see actually that this is not really principle of least action. Um, it's just effectively the action uh, has kind of this lull. So if you move our uh, trajectory around, action doesn't really change. So it has this sort of uh, critical point. It's like a, a either a maximum or a minimum or an inflection point where a derivative vanishes in speaking of language of functions. So in speaking of uh, variation, that means that we also have some sort of critical point of our action. Uh, so that means that uh, action can be minimal or it can be maximal or it can be somewhere in between a uh, critical action where the variance uh, vanishes. And so this sort of lectures are an example of actually maximizing the, the action, but also maximizing the fun. And I'm really hoping that you're having a lot of fun with me. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go to the next part uh, where we're going to look at uh, the connection between uh, um, symmetries of Lagrangian and the conservation laws. Uh, come on over, this is a lot of fun. But before you do, uh, please do the quizzes associated with this lecture. Uh, part and I'm going to see you in part three of lecture five. Uh, stay tuned. See you. Hi, hello. Uh, welcome back to our awesome lecture five in classical mechanics, physics 411. I'm still your instructor, Sasha Chikhovskoy, and I'm super excited to talk about uh, the next uh, greatest and uh, fantasticest things uh, after. Uh, the Hamilton's least action principle, which was a lot of fun. So in this part three of our lecture five, uh, we're going to talk about symmetries and conservation laws. So let's uh, uh, consider uh, an example. Uh, remember, last time we dealt with uh, a rod that we dropped on frictionless uh, table, right? So we had uh, our frictionless table, we had a rod, and uh, so this was its center of mass, this was x, and that was y, and that was the y component of the center of mass, coordinate of the center of mass. So what is important here is that um, the Lagrangian for that system, although details are not important, but what's important is the big picture, uh, had two terms. One term uh, which was associated with uh, its kinetic energy of the center of mass, plus uh, it had a theta term which depended on theta and theta dot, and this functional dependence doesn't really matter. So what's um, important and crucial here is that um, the Lagrange equations that we got from here uh, were d dt of dl dx cm dot minus dl dx cm and that was equal to zero. And you can see here that uh, the Lagrangian doesn't really depend on the coordinate xcm itself, it only depends on its derivative. So that means that um, this term vanishes. And as a result, we are going to conclude uh, that the time derivative of uh, this dl dx cm dot, which is mx cm dot, is going to be zero, uh, which means that we are getting conservation of linear momentum in x direction. So that is cool. So we are conserving. Uh, x momentum of the system. Um, so this means that uh, the reason why this is uh, happening is because L is independent of the coordinate of the center of mass. 
right? It's independent of the coordinate. And so it's because of this independence that this partial derivative vanished, and uh, uh, hence the linear momentum in the x direction corresponding to this coordinate is conserved. Um, and uh, we also refer to this case when the Lagrangian is independent of a particular coordinate as xcm being a cyclic coordinate. So if xcm is cyclic coordinate or equivalently uh, the Lagrangian is independent of axiom. Uh, or it turns out that equivalently uh, the linear momentum in that direction of axiom corresponding to axiom is conserved. So let's kind of try and mesh up our thinking. Uh, this is our new way of thinking uh, that if something, if we have a symmetry, if our Lagrangian doesn't depend on a coordinate, means that the corresponding momentum is conserved. But the standard thinking was different, right? The standard thinking, uh, the Newtonian thinking, was that F equals to MA. And so from here, if F of X is equal to zero, then uh, the linear momentum in the x direction is conserved. So that was our thinking. But the new way of thinking is that uh, if our Lagrangian uh, is independent of the coordinate qi, then the corresponding conjugate momentum pi, which is by definition the partial derivative of our Lagrangian with respect to the corresponding velocity, is going to be conserved. So that is the new way of thinking, that the presence of symmetry uh, namely the independence uh, of L on the coordinate implies that the corresponding or conjugate momentum corresponding to that coordinate is uh, going to be conserved. So um, conjugate to QI momentum, let's be uh, clear and precise here. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. So in example one, let us take a look at uh, uh, the standard uh, linear motion, mx squared over 2. So if L is mx squared over 2, let me maybe make this more compact. So have more room. All right. So if our Lagrangian is just kinetic energy that doesn't depend on x itself, uh, then what are we going to get? Well, the x momentum, the conjugate momentum to x, which is dl dx dot, which is mx dot, is going to be a constant or conserved. Uh, so this is conservation Of linear momentum. Let's take a look at example two. Uh, suppose that we have a Lagrangian that looks like that. So it's ml squared. Oh, let me rewrite this. This looks confusing. So if it looks like ml squared theta dot squared divided by two. So if our Lagrangian looks like that, then the corresponding conjugate uh, momentum, which will be dl d theta dot, will be, what is it? It will be ml squared theta dot, right? 
So this conjugate momentum is going to be conserved. And this is nothing but the conservation of, what is it? This looks like angular momentum, right? So that's exciting. So you see that uh, our coordinate doesn't have to be x or y or z. It could be anything. It could be any generalized coordinate, like in this case theta, uh, which uh, uh, implies motion around the central, the center of our coordinate system. So if uh, there is no dependence of Lagrangian on the theta itself, so there is a symmetry uh, telling us that Lagrangian doesn't care which theta you pick, that's why its partial derivative with respect to theta is zero, then the conjugate momentum corresponding to theta, which is given by definition as dl d theta dot, uh, is going to be a constant. It's not going to change. It's going to be a conserved quantity. So uh, we can kind of summarize uh, the bottom line here is that if L is invariant under translation, uh, then conjugate momentum is conserved. So let me write it here. If L is invariant under translation x x plus epsilon, then conjugate momentum is conserved. I use a different marker. This one is running out. So what we're getting out of this is that symmetry implies conservation. And we're going to talk more about this in the next part of our lecture. Namely, we're going to discuss Noether's theorem. Um, so that will be really cool. And I'm going to see you there after you will be done with the quiz. See you. Hello, hi, welcome to part four of lecture five in our awesome classical mechanics course. Now we are going to talk about Noether's theorem. And namely, uh, we're going to ask the question, what if a symmetry is not directed along one of our generalized coordinates? What are we going to do then? How are we going to determine the corresponding conservation law? That is a big question. So how can we approach this? Well, first of all, let's recap what we learned last time, that symmetry implies conservation. So our goal is to find symmetry if it's not uh, along one of the coordinates. So if that is not along one of the coordinates, so uh, there will be some sort of general uh, transformation of coordinates under which Lagrangian is going to be symmetric, uh, or invariant, rather. So suppose that L, that depends on qi, qi dot, and time, is invariant um, under a transformation uh, of qi to a qi of s. So, for instance, it could be qi gets mapped into qi plus s. So, uh, that could be translation or rotation. So that is what we mean uh, by this transformation. So if we perform this transformation and L doesn't care if it stays the same, then it means that um, 
corresponding momentum to this transformation will be conserved. So how can we show that and how can we get the expression for that momentum? So let's first of all formalize what does it mean that this transformation leaves L unchanged. So L unchanged uh, means that 0 is equal to the full derivative of dl over ds, right? So s can enter somehow into those q's. Uh, so the, if we change the s, then the l change uh, will be dl, and so the ratio of these two will be 0. So dl ds, though, the full derivative, is going to be the sum uh, of over i of dl dqi times dqi ds, right? Plus dl over dqi dot times dqi dot ds, right? And uh, um, all of this is going to be equal to zero. Uh, so what is this is going to be equal to? So what do we need to keep in mind here when we're looking at this and thinking, what are we going to do next? Well, dl dqi is equal to d dt of dl dqi dot by the Euler-Lagrange equations. Therefore, what we have here is uh, really nothing but a full time derivative. So we can write down that uh, this whole thing is going to be equal to the sum over i. Uh, this is ddt of this times dqds, and this is going to be the term itself plus the derivative of dqds. So this is a full time derivative of dl dq dot i times dqi ds. And uh, this is nothing but the conjugate momentum. So this whole expression is going to give us the sum over i pi dqi ds. And uh, this is uh, unrelated to here. So that means that uh, this combination is, uh, oh, I of course lost the time derivative, so let's uh, reconstitute it back. So this is going to be d dt of pi of the sum. the sum of pi dqi ds and that is going to be equal to zero. So what we're going to get out of here is that this combination pi times dqi ds summed over all of the degrees of freedom is going to be a constant or conserved. So, for example, if we have a translation, for instance, uh, then dqi ds is equal to zero. And uh, therefore, uh, our pi times 1 dqi ds, sorry, dqi ds is equal to 1, therefore pi times dqi ds, this will be equal to 1, is going to be equal to a constant or conserved. So as you can see, uh, here we can use it for a coordinate. Uh, for a single coordinate, generalized coordinate, but in general it could be a conservation law that corresponds to 
uh, the invariance of L along any weird direction, not just one of the uh, generalized coordinates that we've introduced. Um, so that is the summary of Nerthus theorem. And uh, this is a really cool uh, way of finding conserved quantities, which are really useful for solving uh, the systems of equations, because if you found a conserved quantity, there is one less differential equation uh, that you need to worry about. And now uh, we're going to move to the part five of lecture five, uh, which is uh, energy conservation. We're going to use a very similar method to derive energy conservation. Stay tuned and don't forget to do the quiz. Hello and welcome to part five of lecture five. Uh, we're going to be talking about symmetries and energy conservation. So suppose that we're dealing with a Lagrangian uh, that has time as the cyclic variable. That is, uh, we're dealing with a Lagrangian of this form. It depends on the generalized coordinates. It depends on the velocities, but it does not depend on time explicitly. So, in other words, time is cyclic variable or dl dt partial is equal to zero. So if that is the case, then let us try and see how can we show that energy or something like energy is conserved. So if L dt, dl dt is zero, the partial derivative, then let us compute, in this case, the full time derivative, uh, dl dt, which we can express uh, by the chain rule as dl dt partial, which is zero, plus dl uh, dqi times uh, dqi dt plus dl dqi dot times dqi dot dt, uh, where in both of these cases, uh, sum is implied. So this uh, needs to be summed over i. All right, so this is good, uh, but um, how can we make something uh, out of it? Okay, let's think about it. So we can use the old trick by using euler lagrange equations to express this as a full time derivative of dl dqi dot. And then now uh, we can write this as dl dt is equal to uh, the full time derivative of uh, dl dqi dot uh, times uh, d uh, Q I D T. Let's check if that is the case. So D D T of D L D Q I. This will be this term time plus times D Q I D T plus uh, the time derivative acts on the other one D L D Q I times the time derivative of that, which will give us the dot over Q I. So this and that are equivalent. Awesome. So here you see that we have time derivatives on both sides. So we can write that dl dt of um, p i q i dot minus l is equal to zero. And let me resurrect for transparency the sum over i over here. So we see that this quantity, let's call it H, is conserved. So uh, that H equal to PI uh, dQI 
dt minus L is a constant or conserved. Uh, so what is this? Uh, is this quantity is this quantity equal to t plus v? So let's try and see uh, whether that's the case. It turns out that it is true in some cases. So this is uh, Hamiltonian as we will see uh, and this is the proper conserved energy. So sometimes energy that we uh, loosely call what we call loosely t plus v is actually not conserved and instead Hamiltonian is the proper conserved quantity. But in some cases, and uh, I'll give you an example of such a case right now, uh, the energy is expressed as t plus v is actually conserved. So let's take a look at that. So suppose that uh, in this example, let us take uh, the particular case of kinetic energy that is a bilinear function of velocities. So T will be a matrix F uh, that depends only on the coordinates, not on the velocities, uh, times QI dot times QJ dot. And uh, the potential is uh, only a function of the coordinates as well. So in this case, let us compute uh, the uh, conjugate momentum first. So PK will be DL uh, DQK dot, uh, which will be, so here, by the way, Einstein's sum is also implied. So we sum in over I's and J's. So when we take a partial derivative of this with respect to uh, qk dot, it means that when i is equal to k, then that term will disappear. And so what we're going to get is 2 fkj uh, times qj dot. And 2 comes from the fact that this is a symmetric sum. So when we get this, uh, we can uh, compute what will be uh, our uh, conserved quantity. So let's compute H, which is PI times QI dot minus L. So PI, uh, or for simplicity, let's actually use K here. So let's, so that K is here and K is there as well. So let's say H is PK times QK dot minus L. And if we plug this in, we will see that we are getting 2 FKJ times QJ dot times QK dot. And uh, we will be subtracting off T minus V. And uh, if we notice that this is twice the kinetic energy, this is equal to 2t, so we get in the end that h is equal to 2t minus t minus v, and that's equal to t plus v. So in some cases, indeed, Hamiltonian, the conserved quantity, can be t plus v, which is the what we commonly think of when somebody says energy. So in this specific case, this is true, uh, and there could be other cases where this is also true. So this is just one case, but it's quite common. Uh, we will see that in um, many practical situations, uh, the conserved energy will actually be given by the standard expression T plus V. But whenever you solve in a problem uh, in classical mechanics, uh, you always want to be on the side of caution, and you want to be using this expression for the conserved energy. Because you can't go wrong if you use this expression. Thank you so much for your attention. This was the last part of the lecture, 
and I'm going to see you in lecture six. Uh, thanks a lot and have a good uh, day. Bye-bye.